We're up to Hebrews chapter 10. I've been reading this chapter rather carefully yesterday and today in the Greek language. And I don't like to bore people with Greek unless there's a good reason for doing so. But going through this particular chapter, I find the first two verses can be, are, are foundational and or they're cardinal verses. And it's better to look at them in the original languages. So I'll look at them in the original languages and I'll translate them. And then I'll only mention Greek occasionally and periodically. Some people actually do like it. Some people don't like it. I'm neutral about it. Um, I can't speak Greek. That's why I can only, they only ever taught me how to read it. I can speak Hebrew, but I can't speak Greek. <clears throat> and of course, biblical Hebrew is close to modern Hebrew. But Greek is something, it's strange. It's like Latin. I just know how to read it. I don't know how to speak it much. So that's it. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. If you're with me, please. I'll first read it in English. For the law, that would be the Torah, since it is only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had the consciousness of sin. <coughs> but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, just in those three verses, we'll read two of them in Greek, or maybe three in Greek. We see a polemic against something that has come into vogue in recent years. By recent years, I mean the last 15 to 20, but particularly the last 10 to 12. That is dual covenant theology. The belief adopted by some philo-Semitic Christians that Jews don't need to be saved, they don't need to be evangelized, they don't need to be born again because they have their own covenant that God gave the Jews, and therefore they can be saved by the law, overlooking the fact that the New Testament is adamant and specific, that by the works of the law no man can be saved. As we always point out, Christians do works because they have been saved, not in order to get saved. A work righteousness is futile. Roman Catholicism is based on a work righteousness. Earning sacramental, earning grace by sacramental ritual, novenas and other such things. Um, it's a work-based righteousness, just like the Torah. It's going back under the law. So too, Islam is a work-based righteousness or a false righteousness. Jehovah's Witnesses are a work-based righteousness. We can never earn salvation through our own works. We do works because we have been saved, not in order to get saved. It is only the completed work of the Lord Jesus on the cross that brings salvation. We work because of what he did. We don't work in order to do what he did. That is, bring salvation. We could never possibly achieve it. We have other teachings, of course, explaining this in much depth in our studies in Genesis and so forth. Nonetheless, it is in the text, so we do mention it in passing. It is a polemic against dual covenant theology. Now, dual covenant theology is not new. Again, in our prologue to this epistle, we pointed out that in the face of persecution by the Sanhedrin, and the impending threat of the Romans. There were Jews in Jerusalem who professed the saving faith in Jesus, who thought that by going back under the law and trusting in the Torah and the Torah sacrifices, that they could still have salvation and avoid being persecuted because they wouldn't identify as followers of Yeshua, of Jesus anymore. And in its immediate context, this epistle is warning that's not true. And of course, it reminds them that the second temple is going to be destroyed anyway. Nonetheless, that is the immediate background. But today, there are people, John Hagee in Texas being one of them, 
he supports Israel and he says a lot of things I like, but unfortunately, among other problems, he's dual covenant theology. He claims that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, which is false, and that we can't hold Jews accountable for rejecting him, and that they have their own covenant. This is dual covenant theology. There are Christian Zionist organizations, not all of them, but some of them adhere to this heresy. It is indeed a heresy. Let's look at it again. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. As you know, Moriel had a big ordeal a few years ago when we had somebody who was professed to have been saved from an Orthodox Jewish background in South Africa. I speak of David Nathan, it's no secret, who we discovered believed certain things and was teaching them without our knowledge. He was teaching that God the Father is not the creator. Then we found out he left the word faith movement, but he did not leave the word faith belief system. He posted a video clip of saying you can pray God's healing power into a tie or jacket and knock people over with it for healing, which is completely contrary to scripture and some of what Moriel has always stood for and it is something that we've always opposed. And then he came out with, in the millennium, the blood of animals will actually atone for sin. They can never atone for sin. That was his wrong explanation of animal sacrifices in the millennial reign of Christ. The reason Ezekiel and Zechariah tell us there will be blood sacrifices, Levitical sacrifices in the millennium is the same reason they were in the Old Testament. In the millennium, the, there are three things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world will not be the world. It'll be the kingdom of the Messiah. It'll be the earth, but not the world. Secondly, Satan will be bound. There'll be no tempter. Um, there'll only be the old nature, but nothing to incite or tempt it. The people born during the millennium will not have the same consciousness of sin that we have. We can think of them as babies. A little baby crawling around doesn't know it was conceived in sin. It doesn't know what sin is. It's oblivious to the reality of it. But its parents know that that baby is going to need to be saved just like everyone. Okay? How do you teach a baby? You know, well, this is the thing. How do you teach people in the millennium about what Jesus had to do to save us. The sacrificial system that is renewed in the millennial reign of Christ is a way to teach what the Messiah did do. The same as in the old covenant before he was born, it was a shadow, a type, a teaching tool of what he would do. Animal sacrifices in the Old Testament or pictures of what the Messiah would do. They taught people about something that he would do. In the millennium, there will be a way to teach what he did do. They don't take away sin. And so obviously, David Nathan, we had to extricate him from Moriel and issue a statement saying we opposed it. Unfortunately, he had many friends and supporters who supported him, um, particularly Studio Scotland and Deborah and Stuart Menelaus continued to promote his videos and defend him for over a year online, knowing what he was. And then they began attacking us and telling people all kinds of false things about us and about me and so forth, because they were promoting a heretic. And this, this became very ugly. But now they, they haven't gone too far, obviously. People know this is wrong, at least the people who really followed Jesus. But unfortunately, many people went along with this. People I knew, Sally Richardson and so forth, they just went with this error. Now, Hebrews tell us it's wrong. It's wrong what he believed. It's wrong what John Hagee believes. Dual covenant theology is wrong, and the idea of animal blood atonement is wrong. These animals are simply pictures, shadows of Christ. A bull, the strong dying for the weak. The goat, a scapegoat a spotless lamb, one man without sin being more 
worth more than all the men with sin. They're pictures of Jesus. They are not capable of taking away sin themselves. They are simply illustrations and will be again demonstrations in the millennial reign of Christ. Okay. So we read that these things can never by the same sacrifices, they often continually make perfect. They could never bring us to the perfection in Christ that God has for us. It doesn't work. And it goes on to say um, something else, that they, it could not clear the conscience from sin. The only thing that can take away the guilt in our conscience from sin, there are two things. One, Satan can so corrupt somebody, and somebody can so give themselves over to moral debauchery that their conscience is seared. It is like a dysfunctional petroleum gauge on a dashboard or a dysfunctional speedometer or a tachometer on a dashboard. It's there, but it doesn't work. They have a conscience, but there is they become unconscionable in their actions. So the mechanism by which the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and draws people to Christ, uh, making them aware of their sin, is not operational. That is widespread now. We are seeing this particularly in the widespread social acceptance of people who go with homosexuality, lesbianism, the LGBTQ thing. These people's consciousness, 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 are seared. So too, we see it with those who are radical abortion proponents, particularly late-term abortion. They ignore all of the medical realities. They ignore the simple hardline facts. And they're driven by it. They're consumed by it under a demonic influence. These people have no conscience. When you can see a baby in an incubator, at 20 weeks gestation living and you're aborting one at 40 weeks and you show them the photos, it doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter what they're doing. These people have a seared conscience. That is the one way somebody can lose um, any sense of guilt. Their conscience is seared. The mechanism that God gave to convict of sin is dysfunctional. God even gives them over to it, we're told in Romans. So that is one way people escape guilt. They become reprobate. They become reprobate. The epistle to Romans deals with this. The second way that someone can get rid of guilt is through the sacrifice of Jesus. As we've explained before, God uses guilt to bring conviction. The term is the eclectic, eclectic in Greek, eklentos, the conviction or convicting of the Holy Spirit. For somebody to be truly born again or to truly understand rebirth, there must be a consciousness of sin and the need for forgiveness. Now, of course, this is under widespread attack today with the seeker-friendly models of evangelism that are not scriptural. We don't see these in the book of Acts. We don't see these in the preaching of Jesus, John the Baptist, or the apostles. It is always repent, repent, metanoia, repentance, teshuvah in Hebrew. The great evangelists who God has raised up through the centuries. You look at, at the D.L. Moody or, or John Wesley, these uh, Charles Spurgeon, they preached repentance. Repentance from dead works, repentance from sin. When you take repentance out of the gospel presentation, you are castrating the gospel message. You are render you are rendering it impotent. Now, God uses guilt to draw people to Christ. Look, you can have forgiveness. God uses guilt to convict believers of the wrong things in their lives. We all have the sin that so easily besets, we all have our weaknesses. And when we mess up, we come under the conviction. 
God wants us to put things right. He doesn't want to condemn, but he does want to put things right. This happens to our conscience. This is guilt. But once we do put things right, we are to stand firmly on the biblical teaching that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. All sin. A believer may have regret about wrong things they did in the past. That's only natural. I suppose we should regret many of the things we've done. Regret is one thing. But guilt? That guilt is not from God. That kind of condemnation is from the devil. I don't care if you had an abortion. I don't care if you were a murderer. I don't care what you did or why you did it. The reason I don't care is because God doesn't care. Whatever you and I were and did, Jesus took that on himself and paid for it. We are not to go around with guilt if we have truly confessed and renounced our sin. We are not to walk around guilt-ridden. The blood of Jesus takes away our guilt. For that blood to be efficacious, we must repent. But if we do, and our faith is in him, it takes away guilt. If there is something in the life of a believer, and sometimes new believers get hit with this, because they don't know the scriptures that well, the devil begins doing a job on them. You did this, you're condemned, and how could you do this as a Christian? And then, you know, that guilt is not from God. Once there's repentance and faith in Jesus, once there's restoration of fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit, guilt has done its job. It's finished its task. God uses guilt to get us to repent. Once we repent, there is no more guilt because God blamed Jesus for what we did. Quite a thing. There's guilt and there's guilt. There's only two ways to get away from guilt. One is when the conscience, not spoon in Hebrew, becomes seared. In the Greek word there is interesting. It, it becomes like Swiss cheese. It just it doesn't work. The conscience no longer works. They can escape guilt. They can do things that are unconscionable because their conscience doesn't work. And it can get to the point where God gives them over to a reprobate mind. Again, I'm revering into Romans. God gives them over to a reprobate mind. They go into debauchery and have no qualms about doing it because the conscience doesn't work. That is one way to escape guilt. <clears throat> For the time being. <laughs> but it is only a temporary and a false escape from guilt. The true and eternal way to escape guilt is through repentance and a saving faith in the Lord Jesus. His blood takes away our guilt. Don't regret what we did? Absolutely. Absolutely. Carry a burden of guilt for what we did before we were saved? No. That is not from God. And when we mess up as believers, God will convict there will be a sense of guilt, but it's there to drive us to repentance. Once we do it, as far as God's concerned, it didn't happen. As it were, Jesus did it, even though he didn't, he was blamed. That's the real gospel. So we have to understand these things. The law and the Hebrew sacrifices could not take away guilt. I've explained this before. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement with the goats, 
kippur comes from the Hebrew word kapora. It means a kind of a sacrifice that covers, that covers. The blood of the goats could not take away the sin. It could only cover it. If there was real repentance and faith, the blood of the goats could only cover the sin until the Messiah came and removed it. That is why Jesus had to go into um, the netherworld. He went into the bosom of Abraham in Hades, and he revealed himself to the Old Testament saints. They were in a place of waiting. They still had the guilt of what they did. They had a temporary covering for it, but not until the Messiah came were they totally liberated. Okay. The law, the Levitical sacrifices, could never remove guilt. Could never remove guilt. They were not designed to. They were to teach about the need to have the guilt removed. <laughs> but they were not there to remove the guilt. They can't do it. They're only pictures of what the Messiah would do and, of course, did do. So we have a polemic against dual covenant theology in this particular passage, okay? And it also speaks against about work righteousness, okay? Now, I'm going to read this from the Greek, if I can muster up the computer skills to bring it up again. I'm looking at chapter 1 of Hebrews, verse 1, okay? Skion. Skion is an interesting word in Greek. It means shadow, shadow. It's a shadow, okay? Skion gar ekon. Ho nomos ton melanton agathon okoti pen ikone ton pragmaton kat and you wait on Thais Altis to see us as prosphorusin esto dikines odopute. The shadow of the nomos, of the law. Okay? The law was a shadow, the Torah, of the law about something that was coming and was even impending. Now remember, it uses this word, melanton. The Jews had the Torah for hundreds of years, waiting for the Messiah as if he were impending. But they had to keep waiting that he was coming, he was coming, as if it was impending. That is the way the seven churches are urged to look upon Jesus. Don't worry, he's coming. Think of it as something impending from God's perspective. What was impending? The agathon, something that was good or of a good things, of good things that were going to come. Okay. And then it says, Oketin ten ikone, not in the same image. Ikone, icon. Okay. Not in the same image. The shadow is not the same as the image. When I was sick in California, near Los Angeles, some nice Christians in Marco Quintana's church made a nice book, Brother Jacob, with the Hebrew word paga, paga, meaning wounded, <laughs> wounded. And uh, it has a collection. And we got thousands of, I got tons of cards from all kinds of people wishing me recovery and everything. They're not all in here, but some of them are. <clears throat> and thank you, Jacob. I heard the brothers and sisters plan to send you a note. I immediately want to do the same. And Brother Jacob, last year I came across you from a 
in-depth Bible study concerning the rapture. And some people say they were saved through our ministry, which is the biggest blessing. But a lot of people, right, sending me get well wishes, say that they came out of wrong doctrine and wrong churches because of us. I only wish as many people came to faith in Jesus through listening to somebody like me as came out of error. I'd much rather see people getting saved. Not that I'm against getting people out of error. I just wish the proportions were different. Dearest Jacob, dearest Jacob and Pavia, dear Jacob, your willingness to follow all this, you know, you're in my prayers. Dear Brother Jacob and our household and fellowship of friends, you're affectionately known as Uncle Jacob, oh Lord. And they have pictures of me and things, and it's from different countries and things. It's a very nice book. Now, we also have a book of hate mail, but I couldn't hold it up. It's the size of the Manhattan Yellow Pages. This is just an ordinary book. But I'm going to use it for something different. I'm going to turn to the back page. Can you see a nice white blank back page? And shadow. Skion icon. Hand is the icon. Shadow. Skion. Icon. Skion. The shadow teaches something about the hand. And the closer the hand gets to the page, the better the definition of the shadow. To the point where the shadow makes it practically possible to recognize the hand when it shows up. The hand that is the icon that was causing the skion. The hand that has substance, okay, um, is causing the shadow. The shadow is not the hand. It's not the icon. It's just the shadow of it. It's there to help you identify the hand when it shows up. The law, the Old Testament, the Torah was the same. It taught something about the Messiah, Jesus. The Levitical sacrifices were types, shadows. They were shadows, we're told in Hebrews, or typus in Greek, about what he was going to do. Skions and tipos are the two Greek words. They taught about what he was going to do. But the closer his coming, became to the faithful believers the clearer the shadow so when he got there the faithful believers like Simeon and Anna in the temple knew it was him <laughs> okay the law was given as a shadow to teach about the substance the skion teaches about the icon but the Skion has no substance. It is nothing but a shadow. Once the hand comes, you don't need the shadow anymore. Once the Messiah came, they no longer needed the temple. There's a new temple, the church. The Levitical temple was destroyed in 70 AD as Jesus predicted fulfilling the prophecies of Daniel 9. The perfect sacrifice came. You don't need the shadows anymore. We've got the real thing, which is Jesus. Okay? That is what Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 are telling us. I will continue. Kuzia, sacrifices, his prosofusid, they are coming towards, prosferusid, they are carrying out or coming towards these, these sacrifices, estodinikes, into the, the finality of odepote, but not yet, odepote, it's coming, but not yet. 
That was true in the Old Testament. It's coming, it exists, and it's coming, but it's not yet. This same concept is used in the New Testament to explain the return of the Lord. The theological term is inaugural eschatology. It's now, but not yet. The kingdom of God is within you. It's now. But the meek have not yet inherited the earth. Christ has not yet returned. Not yet. It's odapute. It's now, but not yet. Now, but not yet. The Bible takes this Old Testament illustration. Jesus was always there. He appeared even in human form in Christophanes. It was now, but not yet. Same now. It's now, but not yet. Udapute. Okay. Yeah. Not yet. When? Udapute. Never. It's never is able. Never. Dunatai, get with Dunamos, doesn't have the power. Dunatos, tos, proskir, prosikomenos, telestai. The law can just never bring us to teleosai. Teleosai, aside from the word telos, the end product, the aim, the target. What we are meant to be. New creations in the image and likeness of Christ. The law could never bring us to that. The one who could bring us to that is coming. But the law could never do it. Only the Messiah could. There is no way to come to perfection in Talmudic Judaism. Because there was no way to come to perfection even in Levitical Judaism, much less the counterfeit of it. There's no way. There's no way false Christianity or any kind of work righteousness. It doesn't matter how many rosaries somebody prays or novenas they go to. They could never bring them to perfection. The only way to come to perfection is through faith in Jesus. There is a sanctification process that takes place where the Holy Spirit is changing us from glory to glory, but that is only possible with Christ, not with religion. We've explained this before. Religion is man trying to reach God. The gospel is God trying to reach man. Religion is man trying to earn salvation by works. The gospel is God giving salvation through the completed work of Jesus. Religion usually amounts to a blind faith. When you challenge Mormonism or Islam or Roman Catholicism, they collapse like a house of cards, at least logically. Some people are deluded and deceived into believing it anyway, but their logical argumentation <clears throat> collapses. Okay, Religion is based on a delusion. It is based on false presupposition. It is a blind faith. Faith in Jesus is a real faith. It is a empirically true that he is risen. Okay. Religion is always the opposite of the gospel. One is God trying to reach man. The other is man trying to reach God. One is the righteousness of man. The other is the imputed righteousness of God. One is a blind faith. The other is a certain hope, a future fact. It's always the opposite. Now, this goes back to Genesis, to the fig leaves. We have other tapes explaining it. I won't go there now for the sake of brevity and time. However, there is one religion that God actually did ordain. Levitical Judaism, Mosaic Judaism, the law, the Torah. That is the one work-based religion 
that God did ordain. However, of the 613 commandments, the largest section were sacrifices to make atonement for the fact that people couldn't keep the rest of it. Year after year, they kept sinning and having to have Yom Kippur. They couldn't keep the Torah. The purpose of the, of the Torah was to show people can't keep it. They need a Messiah. Only Jesus kept the Torah perfectly. That is in large part what he meant when he said it is finished. He kept the law perfectly. Okay. Paul says we establish the Torah. We establish the law in Christ. Okay. The one religion that God gave was to prove religion can't save. You need a Messiah. It was to point to the need of a Savior, of the Messiah, of the Christ, of Jesus. That is the only religion God ordained. All the others are counterfeits. You see this. Just look how Islam counterfeits Judaism and Christianity. All the, what we call in Greek, pseudologons, the false books. Doesn't matter if it's the Bhagavad Gita, doesn't matter if it's the Koran, the Book of Mormon, they all counterfeit the scriptures in some way. They all counterfeit the scriptures in some way. All of them. All of them. So it goes. One religion God gave, the shadow, the skion, to teach about the substance. The purpose of the law was to show it, you can't beat sin, sin is going to win, and you're going to have guilt, you need a savior. Now it comes, why do you want to go back under the law for it? Well, don't ask me, ask Seventh-day Adventists. The oldest trick in the book, Neo-Galatianism. And there are extremists in the Messianic movement doing the same thing. They're trying to live under two covenants simultaneously. Once the substance comes, the shadow is no longer necessary. It's no longer viable. But let's look. Okay. We're continuing. I'm going to read verse 2. Whoops. I'm on that. How do I get this thing? Yep. Epiokan. Episanto. Prosferomenae. Dieto uh, media mian e can ete sune disin hamariton tus latrunas hepax ke catham menos. Around this, you could say since or something like that, but around these things, not ever they cease being carried towards or being offered because not any or literally maybe I mean not yet one it's active singular feminine again having been longer the conscience of sins in other words they would not have ceased to be offered they would not have ceased to be offered now, here he's alluding to what was going to happen shortly in 70 AD. Because the worshippers, once purged, should have no more consciousness of sin. They should not be aware of, of, of their guilt anymore. If those sacrifices could have worked, they would not still be aware of their guilt. Unless their conscience is seared, unsaved people have guilt. They may ignore it. They may suppress it but they have guilt. Now again, this is cruel. I know a woman, a godly sister, but the devil tormented her because before she was a Christian, she had an abortion. She killed her baby and the devil just did this and did this and tormented her terribly. That is not God. 
that baby's with the Lord waiting for her. If that baby was alive, had a spirit, this guilt is not from God. But other women who are not born again, they carry a burden of guilt. They know they killed their kid. They know they killed their kid. No matter what they say, I watched the video of that really left-wing radical feminist, um, what's her name, Chelsea something or other, Handler. The, the joys of being childless. <laughs> they go through all of this stuff. No matter what anybody says, every woman know this, knows that she was psychologically and physiologically and anatomically designed for motherhood. Every woman knows that. Now, there are Christian women who have the grace to be single for the Lord's service. That is a higher calling. We accept that. God does give that grace to certain people to be single for certain reasons. And those who have that grace for the sake of the ministry have a higher calling than people who are married. That's not to demean marriage. It's just to say that people who have the grace to be single for the sake of the ministry have a higher calling than marriage. But no matter what happened, a woman, you look at a natural woman. I, you, it's sort of my, my wife, my daughters, my sisters. When they're pregnant, when they're expecting the baby, especially the first one, everything's a baby. They're focused on the baby. That is what is natural. It's not natural to kill it. These women know what they're doing. Worse still, these gynecologists know that they're committing infanticide. They know it. They know it. They know it. If you keep going this way, your conscience will become seared. You will become virtually insalvageable. Once somebody's conscience is seared, they become given over given over to it they become it's almost impossible i wouldn't say absolutely impossible but almost impossible for someone with a seared conscience to be saved they know it they know it terrible it is absolutely unspeakable but christians that guilt is taken away just think of you having a forty thousand dollar credit card bill you can't pay and your rich uncle picks up the tab for you are you still going to go to sleep frantic worrying are you going to repay something that's already been paid no it's been taken away by someone who loved you how much more is our salvation, our sin, and our guilt is taken away. Otherwise, these animals would not have to have been sacrificed. Uh, they have to be sacrificed perpetually. Their sacrifice would not have ended in 70 AD. Verse 3. All en oteis, animentis, Hamaraton kat eneoton. But in those reminding of the animations, the reminding of, of, of the sins, hamaraton, according to the year. Now, in the Greek, you have a, a slight verse difference than most English translations. Adunaton gerhemai taron kai tregai ephirion. Hamaritus in Greek it goes into verse four. It is not possible or unable. Adunatan. Dunamas is power. A dunatan is there is no power. Get him off with the blood. Taron, like Taurus, the bull, Kai Tregon, or, or the goats. Um Aferin, to eliminate or to remove Hamaritas. Now that Hamaritas is interesting. It, you've got hamaritas, hamartino, hamarteno in Greek. Hamaritas means missing the mark. It is the equivalent of the Hebrew word for sin, chet, missing 
the target, not measuring up to what God expects. And the blood of a bull or a goat is not going to make up for it. Okay. What translates into three verses in the English Bible, it actually is, is, is four in the Greek text. Well, that's enough Greek. I'm happy to tell you now we can basically go back and just look at the English. Verse 5, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you take no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. This makes references to things written in Psalms and in Isaiah. Now, liberal higher critics, so-called theologians, they have taken this and utterly used it to distort the Old Testament. They were saying there was an argument between the Judaism of Moses that the Levites practiced based on sacrifices and what the prophets believed, who were saying sacrifices and offerings you've not desired. Well, predictably, they do the usual two things. One, they ignore the context in which those things were said. What God was rebuking through the prophets is the practice of you're going to the temple and you're bringing the sacrifices for sin, but you're still sinning. There's no repentance. You're relying on the sacrificial rituals themselves, but you're not turning from the sin. You're not making teshuvah. There is no repentance. These sacrifices mean nothing. Now, the idea of the smoke going up is the prayer of the saints, but these are also the fragrances. God tells the Hebrews, because of your sin, I'm not going to sniff your fragrances. In other words, the savory smoke of these sacrificed animals, God's going to reject it. He will take no pleasure in it. Unless you repent, then I will sniff the fragrances. Then I will take delight in it. That's the first thing the liberals ignore, is that context. The second thing they ignore, of course, is the New Testament explanation. We don't want the shadow. We want the substance. We don't want the skion. We want the icon. We don't want the Old Testament type of Christ. We want Christ himself. So God is saying he doesn't want the sacrifices of these animals. He can only accept the sacrifice of his son who prayed, Father, forgive. We have a teaching on that one verse, the prayer that God can't resist. The one prayer that God can't resist was the prayer of his righteous son on the cross, having no sin, but taking the blame for ours, saying, Father, forgive them. That was the one prayer that God himself could not say no to. It was the irresistible prayer. The irresistible prayer was not the prayer of Jabez. Nothing wrong with what Jabez prayed, but that book was stupid. They turned it into a formula incantation that God will have to act if you say this prayer. It's ridiculous. The one prayer that compelled God to act was, Father, forgive. That was the one prayer. And only the sinless Christ could pray it, our high priest. The rest are shadows. God does not want the shadow. He wants the substance. We don't want the shadow. We want the substance. That's what it's saying. Verse 8, after saying above, sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you've not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the Torah, the law. 
Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes the first in order to establish the second. The Torah was only there to prepare the way for the Messiah. The old covenant was there to prepare the way for the new. God would demonstrate through Israel and the Jews the hopelessness and fallen state of the human condition, that the law cannot save, that our own works cannot save, that any standard of righteousness we try to attempt is not going to be good enough. Even John the Baptist, the most righteous man who ever lived under the law, none born among women was greater than John, a t the last and greatest type of Christ, filled with the spirit from his mother's womb, was not worthy to tie Christ's bootlaces. He who was least in the kingdom is greater than John. What does that mean, that John is not in heaven? No, that's silly. What it means is the imputed righteousness of Christ, when he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness, is superior to the greatest righteousness achievable by religion, by law, even by the Torah. John was as righteous as a man could get by the Torah. But the imputed righteousness to Jesus, he takes our sin and gives us his own righteousness, is far superior to the righteousness of even John. That's what that means. I've actually heard cases where, where preachers said that it meant John didn't go to heaven, which is ridiculous. That's not what that meant at all. Understood and exegeted properly. He takes the first in order to establish the second. He had to demonstrate through Israel the fallen state of man and our incapacity to save ourselves and our desperate need for a savior who would be the Messiah. He takes away the first. He, oh, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of of Jesus once and for all. Now, we did a whole Bible study on once and for all. I'd refer you back to it. There's no need to go back to it. But it demonstrates, it proves Hebrews 7, 9, and 10 uh, proves the absolute absurdity of the Roman Catholic and the High Anglican Mass. He dies once and for all. Every priest stands daily ministering, offering time after time the same sacrifices that can never take away sin. But having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. This refers to his second coming. For he has perfected Look at that word perfected in verse 14. Remember the Lord, the, the word tells us that the law could not make us to tell a stone. It could not make us perfected. It could not make us the end product. It, it just couldn't do it. Well, here it says, I'm going to read just in verse 14. Mi eger prosphora to the one carrying the teloken. He has perfected us. Esto diniques tos hegesiaminos. That is the ones being sanctified, the ones being made holy. Now notice this. We are in the process of being sanctified. The Holy Spirit is making us holy. Remember the reference, Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. It is always odepote, now and not yet. In Christ, we've been perf we are perfect. But we are in the process of being perfected <laughs> it's now and not yet we're not what we used to be but we're not yet what we're going to be in christ we're counted as perfect but we're still in the process 
of being perfected. The work of Christ makes us perfect. The work of the Holy Spirit is perfecting us, if that makes sense. We are both perfect and being perfected. Now, how do we understand this? Is this a contradiction? No. Think of a newborn baby. Beautiful little baby. Little baby boy, little baby girl. And they're healthy. And they're so beautiful and they're infants. But they get colic. And they get teething fever. <laughs> and, you know, you got to watch them and take care of them and watch them grow. Oh, Neonatologist says, congratulations, you have a perfect baby, a perfect little girl, a perfect little boy. Perfect. Thank God. Perfect baby. Nothing wrong with it. But it's not yet perfected. It has to grow. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve had no imperfections. They were perfect but they were not yet perfected. They had to eat of the tree of life. Instead, unfortunately for them and unfortunately for us, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the world. Before they ate of the tree, they were not yet perfect, but they were to be perfected. A newborn baby is perfect, but not yet perfected. As new creations, we are perfect. Christ makes us perfect. But the Holy Spirit is perfecting us. I hope that makes it clear what, what the text is trying to explain to us in verse 14. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, he did it once and for all. He sits down at the right hand of God and speaks of his position in eternity and alludes to his coming. We get to verse 15, and the Holy Spirit testifies to us. Now it's the work of the Spirit. When the work of Jesus is completed, Jesus' work was completed in his death and resurrection and ascension. Once his work was completed, now it's the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus deals with us through his spirit, the paraclete, okay? And it says, the spirit testifies to us, saying, this is the covenant I'll make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I'll put my law on their hearts and on their mind, and I will write them. And then their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. <clears throat> this is the Holy Spirit reminding us of the promised new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31, that would not be like the one I made with their fathers. The one I made with their fathers was the law, Levitical sacrifice, over and over. But the perfect sacrifice is the Messiah. This is what Jeremiah 31, 31 predicts. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. He paid for what we did. That's it. It only occurs in the Greek New Testament one time in the Gospel in John the Telestai. Again, that word from Telios, end, paid in full. Paid in full. 